Good morning, guys. Uh, we are here today for the final piece of uh, lecture for Lot 1204, relating to the content from March 27th. And this content specifically is about negligent misrepresentation. So this is the content that leads you into the last few slides in the PowerPoint for today, and specifically the in-process work for today, with, which is linked to the Walford, Walford case. Okay, that's posted on DC Connect for you. So what is negligent misrepresentation? Essentially a statement, a negligent statement on which the plaintiff relied and which caused the plaintiff physical injury or damage to property. Okay, so a negligent statement made by somebody, somebody else relies upon that statement and it causes that person who relied upon the statement some kind of injury. Remember, generally speaking, we talked about um, injury um, linked to damage awards had to be measurable in the context of um, tort law, right? So neg in negligence claims specifically, the plaintiff cannot recover damages for purely economic harm. It had to be measurable harm that was recognized, for example, as harm to the person, harm to somebody's property, or harm to their reputation. The exception to this, and we, we talked about it once before, I briefly mentioned it to you, was the principle that comes out of the Headley Byrne case. So where a fraudulent or knowingly reckless statement has caused somebody purely economic loss, that is when pure economic loss alone will be recognized as sort of a head of damages that um, somebody can claim for in this area of law. There also has to be relationship of fiduciary duty involved. So in other words, I rely upon the advice that somebody gives me. It was a fraudulent statement that they told me. Something was wrong or incorrect about it. It was negligent. They shouldn't have said it. But as a result of that, I've done something because I relied upon the truth, what I believe to be the truth of the statement they told me because of my relationship to them. We're in some kind of fiduciary duty. In a fiduciary duty, there is one person who is supposed to act in the best interest of the other person. And so if they're making a decision on their behalf, they need to consider what the outcome is for that person prior to making the decision. Um, a common example in Canadian law is the federal government. They are supposed to be acting in a fiduciary duty toward the Aboriginal population in Canada and are supposed to be making decisions um, in the best interests of the Aboriginal population. Now, of course, there's a question of if that really is true, and that's a debate for a whole other day. But that's an example of a fiduciary duty. You also would have fiduciary duties arise in cases of doctor-patient relationships or advisor-advisee relationships, maybe in the area of um, a stock brokerage or something along those lines. Okay, so in the Hadley versus Byrne uh, case, sorry, Hadley Byrne case. Um, this is the first time that the court has recognized that pure economic loss can actually lead to a damage award in the area of negligence. What happened here is the plaintiff uh, took some advice from an inaccurate credit report about investing money in this company. The report was in fact created by the bank itself, who are the defendant in this action. The plaintiff acted on the advice in the report and invested. The report was fraudulent. It was not correct, the information therein. And so the plaintiff, who'd already invested in the company, suffered a financial loss. And in this case, the defendant was found liable to the plaintiff for pure economic loss. So this is where we see that pure economic loss um, appear as being an acceptable sort of head of damages for a plaintiff in a negligence action. For a plaintiff to make a claim in the area of negligent misrepresentation, there's a couple of factors or elements that are required for that tort. These are outlined on slide 40 for you in the PowerPoint presentation. Some of those factors that it must exist are one, there has to be a duty of care that is based on a special relationship between the parties. That special relationship is like that relationship of fiduciary duty. So perhaps there's an advisee, advisor relationship Okay, where the advisor is required to give advice to the advisee and act in the best interest of the advisee. Um, it could be, it's been defined in other case law as a government employee versus the public. Um, it could also just be a relationship that's created as a result of some kind of, kind of contract, so a contractual relationship, okay? So first of all, there has to be that existence of a special relationship that creates the duty of care between the parties. The advice given by the person who's acting as the advisor has to have been misleading, inaccurate, or untrue. So the plaintiff would have to show that that statement that they were given was incorrect. 
The defendant had to have acted negligently in giving the advice. So the defendant or the advisor has to use reasonable care in giving advice to people. They can't flippantly give advice that there's no basis for or that is outright wrong. Then the plaintiff had to have relied upon that advice. So he has to have shown that he intended to rely on the advice and that he uh, told the advisor of his plans. Like, I'm coming to you. I need advice. I'm going to act on this. So can you tell me what the best course of action would be, for example? Okay, so the plaintiff has to show that to, to he has to show that he informed the advisor he was coming to him for advice and that he was going to act on it. And then as a result of all of that, there's financial loss to the plaintiff. The idea of a, if a special relationship exists to create that duty of care, um, what does that actually mean? Is the person who, giving the, who is giving the advice an expert in the area? So if they are, that could create that special relationship, um, fiduciary duty type relationship, okay? Is, um, is the advice given in the context of a business, not a social setting? So if you're calling a store to ask for their professional opinion on a product, that creates that business setting relationship, not just those two people at a pool party and somebody's asking another individual about advice about something, okay? Um, is the person receiving the advice, A, act, asking for advice? Are they saying, I'm coming to you for advice? And B, is it foreseeable that they were going to rely upon it? So again, it's that concept again of, did they make it known that I'm coming to you for advice because I need to act on it and I need to know what to do. So can you tell me? And then was the advice intended to be actionable advice? In other words, is the person giving the advice, the perhaps the defendant later on in the action, are they assuming that this individual is going to act on it? Are they saying, here's the advice that I would take if I were you, here's the steps that I would take if I were you, here's what I would do if I were in your situation? Or was it just merely opinion? Did they specifically say, you probably shouldn't act on this, I think it's probably A, B, C, but you need to get advice from somebody who knows better. Okay, so how did the defendant set that advice up? So all of this comes to play in the discussion um, that takes place in Walford. So Walford versus Pioneer Family Pools is a case that I'm having you look at from 2007. It's an Ontario Court of Appeal decision, and it talks about this area of negligent misrepresentation. So this case is posted on DC Connect for you to read through. It's actually not too hard a case to get through because I know we've read through some difficult cases this semester. This one is a little bit easier to read through. Um, easier in the context of how it's written and the plain language that is used, but it has some it has some dark pieces to it. So there's not a death involved, but there is a serious injury involved of a child. So I'll just warn you about that. Um, so the case is posted on DC Connect. There is an article posted about the case if you're trying to wrap your head around it a little bit more, and you can see what that article has to say. It's from the Lawyers Re Weekly around the time this case decision was given. And then the questions itself that I'm asking you to answer for your in process are on the last page of the slides that are posted uh, for this week's content. So slide 42. So essentially, you just need to answer those questions in a Microsoft Word document and upload your Word document to the ongoing in process box, um, the assignment folder on DC Connect. And that is it. I know you've had a multitude of video lectures from me for this week. Thanks for sticking with me. Thanks for watching each one of them. If you have any questions, um, the class discussion for this week has already occurred, but please feel free to email me those, those questions, or you can even ask them next week in our class discussion when we meet again live. Otherwise, take care and have a great weekend, and we'll, we'll meet again soon.